Amen. Let's sing that together as we open up. Oh, how I love Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you, dear Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And dear Lord, we're asking that as we gather in one more time on this Friday evening, that God, you would come and meet with us. May it be a special time. Dear Lord, we've, we've showed up on purpose. We're here dear God, on purpose tonight. We want to hear from you. And dear Lord, we're asking that you would just help us in every way. Dear Lord, in every part, from the singing, congregational song, to the preaching, Lord, may your hand be in it all. And as you would help us and draw us close to you, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, how many are here ready to sing? Wonderful. Amen. Well, before we sing tonight, let me say it's good to have my mother here. She heard me make an announcement about auditions and thought she'd come in tonight. She's one of those people that likes to be up front a lot and likes to have attention brought to her. So maybe she could, no, I won't have her stand, but no. It is good to have my mother here tonight. Uh, I want to read a little scripture before we sing tonight from John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I'm thankful for the promise of the Spirit tonight. He promised that he would not leave us comfortless. Praise the Lord for that tonight. But even better than the promise is the promise delivered. He did come, and he is here, and he's meeting with us this week. I'm thankful for that tonight. We're going to sing about the comforter tonight. The comforter has come if you're using a book, number 291. Sing it out with us tonight. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human woes abound, let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. 
name. And I'm asking you to stand tonight. And we're singing another song about the Comforter, but I like this one. It says, He abides. It's wonderful to know that He's come, but it's even better to know that He's living right inside of me tonight. Praise the Lord. He abides. I'm rejoicing night and day.
ask if they'd keep playing that for just a moment as we get ready to look to the Lord in prayer. We thank the Lord for the help that he's given thus far and how he's helping and how he's working. And we want him to continue to do so. And uh, my heart's open. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful song to sing leading into as we've sung it together as a congregation. But our chairman, Glenn Alexander, is going to come and lead us in prayer. And as he comes to do so, I'd like for us one more time, just where we are, to sing it again, but sing it, maybe you've already been doing it that way, but sing it as a prayer before we begin to call on him in prayer. So, Lord, we just want you to know, I want you to mold me and shape me, fill me, and use me, and fall fresh on me. We need it again and again and again and again, and then we need it again. And so we ask the Lord just to come and help us. So, would you stand with us one more time, and then we're going to Sing this chorus as Brother Glenn leads us, and then we're going to ask him to go ahead and lead us in prayer. fresh and anew upon us. Lord, without your spirit, Father, we can do nothing. And Lord, you have been so good to us here at Hope Sound. You've blessed us in times of past, Lord, but Father, we need your spirit once more in this service, Lord. We can't use your what we've done in the past, Lord, but we need a fresh and anew for you to come and to fill us. Lord, melt our hearts and mold us and shape us into your image, Lord. Help us to be vessels, Lord, that you can use, Lord. Help us to stay on the potter's table, Lord, and help us, Lord, to be molded into your image, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Thank you for your many, many blessings to us, Lord. Thank you of how you've helped in this revival already, Lord. Lord, time goes by so quickly, and we're already till Friday night, Lord. But souls have been changed, Lord. But there are souls tonight, Lord, that need another touch, Lord. There's a soul here tonight that needs your fresh anointing, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that their heart will be open to and receptive, Lord, to what you are going to bring in tonight's message, Lord, that will help them tonight and will change, Lord, their eternity. And Father, we ask that you just go with us. Bless each person that's here, Lord. You know the burdens and the cares that we bring to this service, Lord. You know the things that we can share and the things that we cannot share. But Father, we ask that you go up and down these pews, Lord, and touch hearts and help, Lord, those that need to give up some things and, Lord, those that need to hold on to some things, Father. We ask for your spirit to move among us, Lord. We need you. I need you, Lord. We need you every day. And we're asking, God, that you just continue to fill us till we're overflowing, Lord. And just help us, Lord, each and every moment. Lord, thank you so much for the, the music tonight and the music that's going to be sung. Lord, bless it. Anoint it, Lord, to be used of your, for your kingdom, Father, we pray. And the offering that's going to be taking, Lord, help the funds to come in, Lord, for this these uh, revival services, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you bring, Lord, the message, Lord, that you've laid on Brother Manley's heart, Lord. 
Lord, it's a message that we need, Lord. There's no service or no message, Lord, that's just a throwaway. Lord, these are times that we need to move up spiritually and to gain ground, Lord. And we ask that you bless, Lord, your servant tonight. Give him the words that he needs to say, Lord. Help it to be easy, Lord, and help us to have hearts that are open and receptive, Lord, to be able to take in thy word, Lord, and to apply it to our hearts that we can go out of here and change the world around us, Lord, I pray. And in everything that we do tonight, Lord, we ask it in your precious holy name. Amen. wish that I could have known Jesus as a person and um, and how his word, I felt like God showed me that his word is one way that I can get to know him, get to know his personality so that I can copy him and be more like him. And there are different glimpses that we get of Jesus and her, his personality and his word. And two, two biblical characters are mentioned in this song. Number one, his mother. And the scene is, is at Golgotha. He's on the cross and there's his mother broken, weeping, She's kneeling at his feet. And here is the Son of God bearing every sin that has ever known, has ever been known. Unbelievable wickedness that he had on his shoulders. Physical pain that we can't even begin to wrap our minds around. And he stops and he looks down at his friend and he says, take care of my mother. And then there was Peter and Peter said, Lord, I won't deny you. I'll be right by you. And he was blustery, and, and I admire that about him. And yet when it came right down to it, he denied him three times. But after Jesus rose, who did he say? Hey, he said, go tell Peter, I'm alive. And that tells me a lot about the heart of the Savior. He was always seeking. He was always giving compassion. He was always taking note of who needed his love and his attention. And, you know, it's really no wonder that we call him our Savior. The same love he showed all those many years ago, it hasn't changed. I praise him. Her son weak and dying Hung there on a tree, broken and weeping, she knelt at his feet. Yet through all his suffering, who would believe he'd cry out to a friend to look after her? denied him not once but three times then went into hiding the day that he died then Jesus arose and all were surprised when he said go tell Peter I am This 
very same Jesus became our sacrifice. No mortal man's offering could be close. Savior this evening, and I'm glad that he's my friend. I'm glad that uh, he doesn't just save us and then just kind of leave us to figure this out, but he's a friend that sticks close, closer than a brother. He's there every step of the way, guiding us, helping us to know the direction we ought to go, the steps we ought to take, and I'm so glad he's my friend tonight. How about you? Amen. We're going to receive an offering here in just a moment. And uh, as we do that, we want to thank you for your generous, generous giving throughout the revival meeting. About $1,500 has come in for the revival expenses. Uh, so we have a little bit of ways to go uh, still. Uh, and the Coles, they just keep adding people to uh, their, their, their ministry team that we're going to have to pay. So uh, we really need you to uh, just continue to give generously and help us out if you could, please. Keep in mind, tomorrow's uh, men's breakfast from 8.30 to 9.30 in the Addison Student Center. Keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, also, of course, we're looking forward to um, the weekend of, of services. There will be no service tomorrow morning. We've been having service at 10.45 here in the CEC uh, every morning this, this week, beginning on Tuesday. But no service tomorrow morning, but there will be a service tomorrow night, and uh, God's you know, God's good-looking people come to church and revive on a Sunday night, or Saturday night, I should say, Saturday night, because uh, that's, that's how it works. The rest of them, they all have to stay uh, home to get ready for Sunday. But God's good-looking people, they come to church on Saturday night. So, uh, so we're looking for you tomorrow night. All of you look good-looking tonight, so I think you're good enough to come back tomorrow night at 7.30. And then, of course, uh, on Sunday, uh, 10.30 in the morning and 6.30 uh, Sunday evening, and let's continue to just be praying for these services. Uh, we were favored with a special offertory in uh, chapel this morning uh, by the Trace Hermanos, and uh, they're going to be uh, they're going to be providing a musical selection tonight for the offering as well. So let's let's ask God's blessing on this offering. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege, Lord, to give back to you. We thank you, Lord, how you have been meeting and supplying so many needs in this revival, and we're just trusting, Lord, that you're going to even uh, supply the fin financial need of this meeting. We praise you, Lord, in advance for the help you're going to give. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. I certainly enjoyed that, enjoyed the message to how great is our God. Praise his name. Uh, this afternoon, after they played that this morning, I, uh, I had Ed stop in my office and tune my guitar. I don't know that it's going to help at all, but I thought it couldn't hurt. So he stopped into my office and tuned my guitar. I, I have no doubt that I probably won't help any at all, really, for me, but I at least thought it was worth a try. So, uh, but that was great, fellas. We certainly appreciate you using your talents for God. Amen. Uh, Tim and Julia and Alyssa are coming to minister in song, and then Brother Manley will be bringing the message. We uh, certainly have enjoyed all their ministry uh, throughout this week, and uh, know that God has something special for us in this service here tonight. Amen. So let's give them our attention, but most of all, let's give our attention to the Lord. Have you ever said, would you please just give me another chance? Sometimes you get another chance. But another chance isn't enough sometimes. 
And you need another one after that. And another one after that. And then that realization begins to dawn on us sometimes that what we need is not just a clean slate, a fresh start, but we need a deep change within. I've had police officers give me a second chance, and I'm thankful for that. I've had offended loved ones give me a second chance, and I'm thankful for that. But I'm never so grateful as when I think of the many chances God has given me. But I'm also glad to have learned that his grace is more than just a second chance opportunity, but his grace penetrates to the control center of our heart that can make us want to do the right thing and love the light and walk in his way. The epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans is dripping with rich theology. He begins by reminding us the big, big trouble we're in, everyone, Jew and Greek alike. He almost sets it up as if it was a court case. And we, the defendants, begin to hear the charges against us. And we begin to hear that there is no one that does righteousness, no, not one. We all, like an unclean thing, have turned away and lower and lower our heads begin to bow in that courtroom when we realize we have no right to have an access to a holy God. We have no privilege. We have no reasonable expectation that we could ever have a conversation let alone a relationship with this holy God. But God, who is rich in mercy, has become the justifier while remaining just himself. He makes guilty sinners free and pardoned and We come to Romans chapter 5 and we rejoice in verse 1 where the apostle says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has changed for every soul who knows that. Who knows that no longer does the guilty sentence hang over my head. And if you want to change, that's step number one. You need to be in a justified position. You need to be in the right position. And thanks be to God, he can justify us. What beautiful examples he gives us of Abraham and David. The Jews and the Gentiles alike can know this beautiful gift of being given a fresh start. But we soon begin to realize that a fresh start is not enough in itself. We need a power to keep going. Whatever you think of Romans chapter 7, you have to come to the realization that at some point, man in his best efforts is never enough. And to come to that sad realization that he cannot live a life on his own to please God. But you just have to turn the page to Romans chapter 8 and you've got to at least read verse 1 where it says this. (laughs) There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So we need to be in the right position, justified, and we need to have the right power. We need to have the Spirit's power. I don't know if you all celebrate Christmas down here or not. It just seems really hard to do that when it's so nice down here. But up our way, we we do that. And these people buy these uh, inflatable things that go in lawns to uh, make uh, 
snowmen and reindeer and whatever else. And against the night sky, with those little air pumps filling those big canvas material up and the lights all around, it looks amazing. But after the night is over and the sun begins to shine and those fans are turned off and those big inflatables just collapse, it looks like somebody trashed somebody's front yard. There's extension cords and canvas material lying all around and you just say, that doesn't look good. Because there's no spirit inside those inflatables, there's no air inside, there's no lift, there's no life inside of them. It's about as pitiful as it is when somebody who tries to live the Christian life without the spirit. It's a messy heap. It's just not pretty. It doesn't fulfill the plan of the designer. But when you have the Spirit, and Romans chapter 8 is a glorious chapter on what the Spirit does and how it works within us, how beautiful it is to know that. I hope you know the, the fullness of the Spirit. So appreciated the emphasis on the Holy Spirit tonight. What a, what a wonderful person the Holy Spirit is. And Do you know the Holy Spirit loves you? Yes, Jesus loves you, but let me tell you, the Holy Spirit loves you too. He whispers to you and he wants you to know him. He, he loves you too. But Paul takes us even deeper into the plans of God when he reminds us not just the right position and not alone the right power, but we, we, off, we also need to make the right present. We, we need to give the right gift to God. We, we need to present ourselves a living sacrifice to God if we're going to move beyond just a fresh start. Romans chapter 12 is that beautiful call in light of everything that God has done. Pulling us out of a guilty jail cell and lifting us up and putting his spirit within us and now giving us the opportunity of presenting something acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God. This is what he says. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present you gift, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In God's plan, he not only wants to give us a new start, a fresh start, to justify us, but through the Spirit's aid and through our willing sacrifice, he would make us sanctified, cleansed, acceptable, perfected, available for the use of God. In this service tonight, I have the sense that God wants to talk to some of us, all of us, about not just getting a fresh start, though thank God for that, but doing something deep within us that changes the inner world of all of us, the control room of our hearts. And one of the ways that we do that is by offering our whole selves to him, making ourselves a living sacrifice. That God would even be interested in us is amazing, but that he would welcome us to present ourselves to him. A few years ago, Janelle and I um, bought our first home. We've been so thankful for church-provided housing over the course of most of our lives, married lives. But we kind of bought a fixer-upper, to tell you the truth. 
we had big dreams and high hopes when we bought that thing, and then uh, we realized we bought ourselves a lot of work. And there's certain parts of that house that I would, I would be fine for you to see, but there's other parts that we, we, haven't, we haven't quite got to yet. We're, we're, we're working on it. We're, we're paying as we go, and you, you know that takes a little while. But you know, when, when we bought that house... We bought all of that house. We didn't just buy those nice hardwood floors in the living room. We didn't just buy that lovely decorated room that my wife has put her beautiful creative touch to. But we bought the basement too. And we we bought that section of the yard where somebody who'd lived there before just dumped some junk some places that were outdated the fixtures were old there was paneling and paper and stuff that's just gross but when we bought it we bought all of that and if you were to come to our house um, it's, it's getting better But if you would have come to our house the day after we bought it and we hadn't even got to touch some of that stuff and you'd say is this yours? Is this you? <laughs> we would love to tell you, yeah, 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 it is, but, but let me tell you what we have in mind. And somebody would say, you own this, don't you? Yes, 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 we do. You know, when Jesus bought you, when he paid the ransom price with his blood, he, he bought all of you. He bought the good parts about you, and he bought the not-so-good parts about you. He bought those parts that you're not afraid for people to see, and then he bought those parts of you that you'd rather hide. And the day after he bought you, if the old accuser would have come along and said, You bought this? This is yours? Can you not almost hear the Savior say, Yes, but wait! (laughs) I'm not finished yet. I'm, I'm still, I, I have plans for that. So justification helps bring us into that relationship with God, but it is that work of sanctification, initial and entire and progressive, that makes us more and more into the image of God where there's not one part of the house that we have to be ashamed of. How are we doing with that? For God to do his work in us, for him to update and renovate and change and clean up, we've got to give him access to all of that. And so that's, that's where we get that entire thing about, you know, your whole spirit, soul, and body, as Paul prays. As, as Paul also tells us here in Romans 12, your, your body, I mean, that just, that just, like, That's the whole box right there. That captures all that you are in one container. Mind and spirit, body. Would there be any hesitation to let God just clean every part of that? Just just let him have it all. And I have the assurance to give to you from the word of God that whatever you give to him, whatever you present to him, he will happily accept, and he will begin to work on that and cleanse that and make it what it ought to be. If you hadn't guessed tonight, I'm, I'm preaching to you about living a holy life, a life of entire surrender and entire sanctification, something that you don't have to be afraid of, him, him taking control of the whole house. You can have the right position, the right power, but you need to give him the right present too. Let's think about a few things here. What, what, would, what would be involved in giving that, that present to him? We all have affections. We, we, we have things that we love. We, we have things that are dear to our heart. It, and it is amazing, isn't it, how quickly when you get acquainted with people that you'll figure out what it is that they love. Some... 
Uh, some people, it's their grandchildren, and they're quickly showing you pictures and telling you stories and ad nauseum. It's just that, that long sometimes. And then, and then you just know that, you know, some people, man, it's their, it's their car, it's their truck, it's, it's their technology, it's uh, whatever. It, whatever it is, they love it, and you know that's their, that's their big love. You know, you know, God has everything. He owns everything. He, he doesn't need any of your stuff, but he, he really does want you, and he, he, wants, he wants your love. And he wants to make sure that there's no affection for any other thing that is higher than, you, than him. What would, what would you think if I, if I pulled my wallet out tonight and I produced some pictures of some old girlfriends that I've been carrying around. Well, what would you think of that? You'd say, how long have you been married? And why are you carrying these pictures around? And maybe I could get a little defensive and I would just say, whoa, I've got history with these girls. I mean, this was a junior high relationship. I don't want to forget about her. And you say, Bro, when are you going to let that go? <laughs> you would think by now I should let that go, right? I mean, that's, that's old news. And by all means, I shouldn't be stalking her on Facebook, right? I mean, I should, or Instagram or anything, and keeping up. There should come a time when, when my wife has become the love of my life and all those other loves have just been done away with. We laugh about that in a human relationship, but isn't it amazing how our mind can justify just kind of holding on to some old loves of the past and saying, you know, I've got history with this. I've got some affinity to that. I just, and, and there comes a time where you, you, you just got to cut it off. You got to let it go. And there's no Love that has any more power than the love of God in your life. You, you want to please Him above every other love. Those, uh, those people that Jesus talked about who loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Those people pleasers. God has to deal with that somewhere. Where, where we would rather diss on God and be cool with our people than to say, God, I would rather please you and be a little bit odd in the eyes of somebody else. And God has to deal. And so we bring that to the altar and we say, I care too much about what my friends think about me and I'm going to lay that down. I care too much about what my image is, and I, need to, I just need to lay that down. And so we can't let the love of others' ap approval eclipse our love for God. Attractions. We, we all have amazing interest in attractions, and it's, it's the case of what I call the, the spiritual wandering eye. You ever, you ever talk to somebody that has a wandering eye, I'm not talking about some neurological or muscle problem with their eye, but I'm saying it's an attention problem. It's, it's a focus problem. Does that, does that ever annoy you? Well, I'm just telling you what annoys me sometimes, so maybe I need to talk to somebody that helps me with those kinds of things. But, you know, you try to talk to them, and they, I mean, their, their eyes are just everywhere else, and, I mean, the door opens, and they have to see what's going on. Somebody should say, would you, would you just focus for a minute? Let's, let's talk. It's so, so nice when you've got somebody's attention, you can actually have a meaningful conversation. The spiritually wandering eye is, is something that needs to be sacrificed unto God. When somebody offers you something to do that you know is not pleasing to God, what are you going to do about that? You say, no, I'm going to keep my focus right here, right here. 
You remember that man Achan in, in the Old Testament that God says, when we take the city, nobody, nobody takes any spoil from this mess. It's got to burn. But he got his eyes on some of the precious metal, and some of the, the beautiful garments, and said, I, I, think I, could, I think I could make a deal with God on this. That wandering eye has to be brought in. Used to love to play with magnets when I was a kid, still fascinated by them, and found it always interesting that, you know, there's the, the negative and positive ends on them, and, and when you turn them a certain way, they'll actually repel one another, but then when you get them turned the right way, they'll just pull towards one another. You know what God wants to do for you in this, in this presenting of yourself? He wants to get you so turned on the inside that you, you want what he wants. There, that, that fight, that antagonism against God is, is dealt with, and you say, take it. If it means my girlfriend, if it means my money, if it means my reputation, I'm, I'm laying it on that altar. But maybe you've done that. You don't have a problem. Some of us don't care so much about what people think. That's not our... That's not our hang-up, but some of us have some ambitions that get us in trouble. You remember um, James and John, Mark chapter 10, they come to Jesus and they say, would you, would you grant us that we could sit one on your right hand and the other on your left whenever you set up your kingdom? They had ambition and there's, a, there's certainly a place for sanctified ambition. I, I pray for that. I pray, I pray God will give it to us. But there is a thing called unholy ambition, too, that, that makes us want to be seen and want to be noticed and want the place of power and dominion. And, and Jesus, Jesus rebukes them for that. And this is sometimes where some of us have to have to come to the altar and make a living sacrifice and say, this is, this is my dream, this is my ambition, but if it's not your ambition for my life, if it's not your dream for my life, I'm just going to lay it down. And I, if I never get to pick it back up again, then that's just going to be okay. Some of you have heard me tell this story, and honestly, in some ways, I'm not proud of it, but it... Uh, it just uh, sometimes helps some of us to think through how subtly our hearts can begin to hold on to certain ambitions that aren't tracking in God's way. I got a call to preach um, in my senior year of high school and began to get serious about fulfilling that and doing what I could to serve God. And I got to Bible college and I found out that not everything was easy. I found out that uh, there's a lot of work to keep up with everything, especially when you're working your way through. And I got tired and sometimes when I got tired, my mind started to wander and I began to think about alternatives to what I was doing. Some months before I had uh, gone to Bible college, I had the privilege of being part of a little short-term missions trip. We went out to work in some uh, Indian reservation work out in Arizona, and accompanying or part of that trip, we, uh, we got to do some sightseeing, went down through southern Arizona, stopped by Tombstone and some other places, and I just, I just found it absolutely fascinating. Just loved that little town. And I remember when I had a stack of homework to do and all these other things happening in my life, I'd just kick back and I would, I would start to think about, yeah, what if I just break out of here? Where would I go? What would I do? And, you know, the craziest thing was I would start to think about that little southwestern town in southern Arizona called Tombstone, and I'd say to myself, yeah, I'll bust out of here. I'll go to Tombstone. Give me a care of pair of cowboy boots and live out there and I just forget this place. And then something would pull me back to reality. I'd get back to work and I'd 
do my thing and forget about it. But it seemed like sometime later when, when stress was high and the pressure was on and, you know, your heart's just kind of tired, I'd say to myself, I'm getting tired of this place. I think I want to do something else. If I left here, where would I go? What would I do? Oh, yeah, I know what I'd do. I'd go to Tombstone. I remember that little town. I remember that little general store where those locals would sit and talk about the mountain lion they saw the day before. And I just think, man, that'd be a great place to be. I'd buy me a pair of cowboy boots. I'd, be, I'd just fit right in with those guys. Eventually, I'd shake it off and move on and uh, just forget about it, you know. My senior year of college, I, I, really, I really found God to drill down in some areas of my heart that I'd never had him probe before. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I thought I was surrendered and doing, doing what I should do, but he began to talk to me about some areas of surrender and would, would you believe, would you believe one of the things that he talked to me about was tombstone? I said, I said now, Lord, you know that's, that's just a crazy idea. I just, you know, I just kind of think about that now and then. But it's, it's, it's never going to happen. I don't. But he, he, he didn't take my answer. Now, I don't, I, I'm very careful not to put words in God's mouth, but it just seemed to me that God was pushing back on me and saying, well, if, if it's not an issue, why do you keep going back to it? Why do you keep hitting that button whenever the pressure gets to a certain It's like your back door. It's like your escape hatch. You, you keep thinking, yeah, this is what I'll do. And when God began to show me that ambition that was off and that kind of that, that escape mentality, I saw it for what it was. It was terribly selfish. It was very conditions-oriented obedience. If, if the conditions are right, then I'll obey you. If everything's good, then I'll be fine. But, but if you call me to a level of commitment that's more than I'm willing to do, then I'm, I'm done. I'm going to check out. And it seems as though God said, that's what I want to fix in your heart. You, you've, you've got this escape hatch that you keep very handy. I want... All of you, I, I want a living sacrifice. And suddenly God began to like roll this tape of what life could be if I didn't let him do that. I would have this constant surge and then pulling back and surging forward and pulling back because I didn't, I didn't like how that worked and I, I don't like this situation and I'm not sticking with that. I'm pulling back. I'm done with that. And he said, I can't fully use you like I want to if that's going to be the way you operate. You see, I needed more than a fresh start. I needed a change down inside. I needed that spirit to do something deep within me, but it would only happen as I presented myself, as I gave that access to God to do that. That self-will, that self-interest that says, I, I'm going to give you most of the controls, but I've got an emergency break back here that I'm going to pull if I have to. If you start leading me somewhere, I don't want to go. And when I got a view of that, there was something inside of me that saw how awful that was. I said, well, God, forgive me for even entertaining that. Forgive me for even thinking that. I, I don't care if I ever go to Tombstone again. Or wherever it is that I try to find some other happiness outside of your will. I don't want that. I want you. Never been back to Tombstone. Don't know if I ever will or not. Be fine if I do, but... It's okay if I don't. 
But the better thing, the better thing is, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Because I'd rather, I'd rather have him than anything. And so do you see what I mean? We need more than just a fresh start. We, we need a sustaining power down within. And, and that power doesn't seem to come without us allowing God to do a deep work within us and saying, here we are. Here I am. So how about you? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know you're in the right position with God, justified, made free from your sins? Does, does, he, does he speak to you tonight about anything that's like, that is, that's your emergency break. That's your escape hatch right there. And if you would let me, I will help you move past that hang up in your life. I can tell you tonight, it's good to be free. It's just good to be free. To serve God without any preconditions. And you just say, you lead, I'll follow. Anybody need to pray about any of that tonight? We could have some music, please. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Um, God knows if this is something that touches you, awakens something inside of you, deals with something that needs to happen in these moments. More than a fresh start, but a deep change within. Pray God would make us so sick of ourselves. In our selfish way, and we see it for what it is, that we say, I, <laughs> I'm sorry I even thought that. I'm sorry I even acted that way. I, I, I give you all of the rights that I've held for myself. I give those to you. I do believe that God wants to use this generation. In some ways, I, I envy some of you graduates and some of you Bible college students, some of you young people, because you, you have a whole life ahead of you. And some of us, the hourglass is beginning to shift pretty far. But the best way you can prepare yourself for ministry is allowing God to have all of that inner world of yours letting him control you completely that you know I am a living sacrifice for him tonight. I might be talking to some adults tonight that have been entertaining some pretty crazy thoughts. If, if, if all of the pieces lined up just right, we would pull the trigger and do something really dumb really selfish I know the devil can put crazy thoughts in our head and I I don't want to judge you for that but I, I do want to say when we begin to foster that and savor that and cultivate that it, it takes us away from that special bond with God be a good time to let God take care of that too. I'm going to pray together in just a moment. Several have come and God is working. I'm not a high pressure. I'm not going to ride you with guilt. Just give you the opportunity to respond to the Savior tonight. There's some of us that are probably dealing with some very deep issues as we pray. So would you, would you give as much support and encouragement as you can to those that are praying tonight and help them to know that God is, is able to help them. Would you come and pray with those who are here if you're able? 
Let's just take our time together tonight, letting God be God.